This two-part video will be focusing on the case of the infamous Typhoid Mary, who, like the General Slocum, made her own contribution to the dark legacy of North Brother Island. North Brother Island itself appears to be something of a hub of misfortune. The island was used as a place of refuge for those who were lucky enough to survive the 1904 General Slocum steamboat disaster, but it was also the unintended short-term resting place for the hundreds of victims whose corpses washed up on the shores of North Brother Island as a result of the disaster. The General Slocum caught fire during her morning trip up the East River, and fire spread rapidly. After realizing the gravity of the situation, Captain Van Shake ordered the pilot of the ship to move full speed ahead until ordering pilot to beach the General Slocum on the shore of North Brother Island. With hundreds already dead in the water, the hospital staff from Riverside Hospital, located near the shore of the island, went to provide aid to the survivors of the disaster. The hospital was originally located on Blackwell's Island, now Roosevelt Island, but moved north of the treacherous waters of Hellgate, relocating to North Brother Island in the mid-1880s. A decade and a half before the turn of the century up until the 1940s, Riverside Hospital had a quarantine ward that housed patients suffering from various communicable illnesses, illnesses such as smallpox, tuberculosis, and typhoid fever, and one of the patients that spent decades of her life confined to this island was the infamous Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary. Mary Mallon, an Irish-born cook, emigrated to the United States, spending much of her career working as a cook for several affluent individuals and families in the New York Tri-State area. During the course of her career, Mallon is believed to have infected over 100 people with typhoid which led to at least three confirmed deaths. Mary was an asymptomatic carrier of the illness, and what led investigators to believe she was intentionally infecting other people was her mysterious pattern of behavior following the outbreaks. When an outbreak occurred at her place of employment, Mary would quit and relocate to another place of employment. She would repeat this pattern of behavior several times before being caught and forcefully quarantined on North Brother Island. This video is going to detail the case of Typhoid Mary and how she made her own contribution, a contribution that added to the dark legacy of North Brother Island. But before we carry on with today's video, make sure to hit that subscribe button so that you can remain up to date with this channel's content. And with that said, sit back and enjoy. Mary Mallon was born in 1869 in Cookstown, County Tyrone, Ireland. As for the origins of her infection with the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, she may have been born with it as her mother was infected during pregnancy. In 1884, at the age of 15, she emigrated from Ireland to the United States, living with her aunt and uncle for a time, and worked as a maid. But with the passing of time and experience, she eventually became a cook for affluent families. Between 1900 to 1907, Mallon worked as a cook in the New York City area for eight different families, seven of whom ended up contracting typhoid. In 1900, Mary worked in Westchester, New York, where within two weeks of her employment, residents developed typhoid fever. Then in 1901, she relocated to Manhattan, where members of the family for whom she worked developed fevers and diarrhea. And then in June 1904, she was hired by a prosperous lawyer by the name of Henry Gilsey. Soon, four of the seven servants were ill, but none of the members of Gilsey's family were infected because they resided separately. The servants lived apart from the Gilsey family, residing in a house of their own. Immediately after the outbreak began, Mallon left and relocated to Tuxedo Park, where she was hired by George Kessler. Two weeks later, the laundry worker in his household was infected and taken to St. Joseph's Regional Medical Center, where her case of typhoid was the first in a long time. The investigator, Dr. R. L. Wilson, concluded that the laundry worker had caused the outbreak, but he failed to prove it. The laundry worker died soon afterward. Then, in August 1906, Mallon started a new job in Oyster Bay on Long Island, working for the family of a wealthy New York banker, Charles Elliott Warren. Mallon went along with the Warrens when they rented a house in Oyster Bay for the summer of 1906, and from August 27th to September 3rd, six of the 11 people in the family came down with typhoid fever. 
The disease at that time was unusual in Oyster Bay, according to three medical doctors who practiced there. The landlord, understanding that it would be difficult to rent a house with the reputation of having typhoid, hired several independent experts to find the source of the typhoid outbreak. These experts took water samples from pipes, faucets, toilets, and the cesspool, all of which were negative for typhoid. George Soper, an investigator hired by the Oyster Bay property owner after the outbreak there, had been trying to determine the cause of typhoid outbreaks in affluent families when it was known that the disease typically occurred in unsanitary conditions. He discovered that a female Irish cook, who fitted the physical description he had been given, was involved in all of the outbreaks. Soper was unable to locate her because she generally left after an outbreak began without giving a forwarding address. The Park Avenue outbreak helped to identify Malin as the source of the infections. Soper learned of the case while it was still active and discovered Malin was the cook. Soper first met Malin in the kitchen of the Bones Park Avenue penthouse and accused her of spreading the disease. Though Soper himself recollected his behavior, as diplomatic as possible, he infuriated Malin, and she threatened him with a carving fork. When Malin refused to give samples, Soper decided to compile a five-year history of her employment. He found that, of the eight families that had hired Malin as a cook, members of seven claimed to have contracted typhoid fever. Then Soper learned where Malin's boyfriend lived and arranged a new meeting there. He took Dr. Raymond Hubler in an attempt to persuade Mary to give them samples of urine and stool for analysis. Malin again refused to cooperate, claiming that typhoid was everywhere and that the outbreaks had happened because of contaminated food and water. At that time, the concept of healthy carriers was unknown even to healthcare workers. Soper published his findings on June 15, 1907, in the Journal of the American Medical Association. He wrote, It was found that the family changed cooks on August 4th. This was about three weeks before the typhoid epidemic broke out. The new cook, Malin, remained in the family only a short time and left about three weeks after the outbreak occurred. Malin was described as an Irish woman about 40 years of age, tall, heavy, single. She seemed to be in perfect health. Soper notified the New York City Health Department whose investigators realized that Malin was a typhoid carrier. By sections 1169 and 1170 of the Greater New York Charter, Malin was arrested as a public health threat. She was forced into an ambulance by five policemen and Dr. Josephine Baker, who, at times, had to sit on Malin in order to restrain her. Malin was transported to the Willard Parker Hospital, where she was restrained and forced to give samples. For four days, she was not allowed to get up and use the bathroom on her own. The massive numbers of typhoid bacteria that were discovered in her stool samples indicated that the infection source was in her gallbladder. During questioning, Malin admitted that she almost never washed her hands. This was not unusual at the time. The germ theory of disease still was not fully accepted. On March 19, 1907, Malin was sentenced to quarantine on North Brother Island. While quarantined, she gave stool and urine samples three times per week. Authorities suggested removing her gallbladder, but she refused because she claimed she did not believe she carried the disease. At the time, gallbladder removal was dangerous, and people had died from the procedure. Malin was also unwilling to stop working as a cook, a job that earned more money for her than any other. Having no home of her own, she was always on the verge of poverty. After the publication of Soper's article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Malin attracted extensive media attention and received the nickname Typhoid Mary. Later, in a textbook that defined typhoid fever, she again was termed Typhoid Mary. Soper visited Malin in quarantine, telling her he would write a book and give her part of the royalties. Mary angrily rejected his proposal and locked herself in the bathroom until he left. She hated the nickname and wrote in a letter to her lawyer, I wonder how Dr. William H. Park would like to be insulted and put in the journal and call him or his wife Typhoid William Park. Not all medical experts endorsed the decision to forcibly quarantine Malin. For example, Milton J. Rosenau and Charles V. Chapin both argued that she just had to be taught to carefully treat her condition and ensure that Mary would not transmit the typhoid to others.
Both considered isolation to be an unnecessary, overly strict punishment. Malin suffered from a nervous breakdown after her arrest and forcible transportation to the hospital. And this pretty much wraps up the first part of this two-part video. With the information provided thus far, do you believe Mary's intent was wholly malicious? Or was Mary Malin innocently oblivious of her condition? Was this treatment towards Mary by health officials completely warranted? Or was it absolutely abhorrent? Let us know what you think down below. Also, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And with that said, I'll see you in part two.